the big man. payback, you know. Sometimes in life, I guess that you probably shouldn't look for revenge, but because I'm storming. <laughs> <laughs> and by the way, Ivan, you are not my boss, okay? I do not work for you. I was joking. I always give Ivan a hard time. We have Dr. Kakoza. Uh, um, Kakoza. Yes. How are you, Doc? Good. How are you? God, how did how you become a doctor? <laughs> a lot of school. A lot of schooling. <laughs> so where are you from, Doc? Originally from uh, Northern Virginia. Okay. Mm -hmm. Northern Virginia. Yeah. You know, is, where, where, where is that close to? That's right outside D.C. Right outside of D.C. Mm -hmm. Okay. It's a lot of military down there, though, right? Yes. Yes. Yeah. So how did you get here to Delaware? It's a long story. I I, I lived in Boston for over twenty years. That's where I went. My, to my son went to um, Emerson College. Great. Uh -huh. Yeah, I went to college there, medical school, um, and uh, the first part of my early career was spent in Boston. I moved to Delaware two years ago to come to Christiana. Oh, good for you. Yeah. Doc, I want to talk to you a lot about a number of different issues, especially as it relates to the black community. Yes. Um, I think a few things come to mind, high blood pressure, hypertension, mm -hmm. heart disease. Yep. And is, is a lot of it hereditary or is it just the way we eat and live in our communities? So for chronic diseases, some of it is genetic and hereditary, and you see it run in families, but some of it is also based on what you eat and lifestyle. Okay. An, 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 another pandemic, as you know, is just really sweeping our country is yes. the COVID-19. And again, another thing is just in our communities, and people still can't get a grasp on it. What, what, is, what is this disease? Where did it come from? How, do, how can we handle it as a community? So there are, coronaviruses are not new. Um, a lot of respiratory illnesses are caused by coronaviruses, but COVID-19 is a new virus in mm -hmm. the coronavirus family. So this is a new disease. Um, and as we all know, the, it started to break out in late 2019, early 2020, um, and took off across the globe. Um, and it causes um, a, a constellation of respiratory symptoms. Um, and as you mentioned, what we've seen nationally and we learned early in the very early days of the pandemic was it was having significant uh, impact on communities of color in particular with higher rates of infection and higher. But why mortality. is that? Do they know? I mean, I know it's new, right? So is there any research that says why or we just, just because we just have to be black and we catch everything? So it's a good question, and there's a lot of research. I ask good questions, Doc. You do ask good questions. Um, but there's a lot of research going into understanding how or why we're seeing those disparities. One thing we know is that um, racial and ethnic minority populations experience higher rates of hypertension and diabetes and other chronic diseases. Um, and we know that when you have pre-existing conditions, it makes you more susceptible to infection. Oh, is that what it is? That's part of it we think. Um, we also know that um, this is a virus that's transmitted based on close contact. Um, and uh, that's why we're always telling people wear a mask, wash your hands, social, social distance. distance yeah. But a lot of um, essential workers are people of color. They're, the essential workers are people who are taking care of people in their homes, home health aides. They're working in grocery stores, um, working in the healthcare field. Uh, and so they're in settings where there's higher risk for transmission. So around this time, right, I guess this is a flu season. Yes. So with your immune system, you can answer better than I. Mm -hmm. Should you take a flu shot knowing that you could catch COVID. I don't know the answer. I mean, people watching, we, we probably want to tell them, how should you handle it? Should you get a flu shot? Absolutely. Please, please. I'm going to look in the camera. No, go. Please, please yeah. get your flu shot. Uh, Does it matter age? It doesn't matter the age. Um, so getting your flu shot is critically important, especially this year. As we move into fall and winter, this is the start of flu season. You're correct. Um, uh, but we also know that the way that coronavirus works is the same way that the flu works. So uh, we're anticipating an increase in coronavirus cases as well. So what protects you from coronavirus will also protect you from flu. So wearing a mask, washing your hands, social distancing, but we have a vaccine for the flu. We've been waiting on this vaccine for the coronavirus, but there is one oh, for the you. flu. Got so you. get one for the flu, protect yourself from that because that also kills. So protect yourself from the flu. Um, and take all those other steps, masks, hand washing, et cetera, to protect yourself from coronavirus. Let me ask you a question. I, 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 
I guess this is kind of confusing to me. Mm-hmm. I remember Dr. Turner was my doctor, Dr. Mm-hmm. Sinyoki. All these guys went out of business. It seemed like they kind of just, um, even Dr. Guy, I don't even know if she's. So now it seems like it's a cluster. Everybody, I mean, you go into a doctor's office and it's like 45 people compared to then it was 10. Mm-hmm. Is it the healthcare system? Is it because of uh, the, what the, the record keeping? I don't know what. What's that change? What what happened with that? You mean in terms of the number of the people in the waiting room? Yes. In the waiting room and have just doctors, right, being frustrated with the whole, I don't know, Obamacare, I don't know, whatever care. You understand my my questioning? Help me understand I guess my questioning is right. It seems like even in our communities, right, Yep. where we would always have a black doctor. Mm. It just, I mean, if if you don't go to Christiana Hospital, Wilmington Hospital, Mm -hmm. or one of the side health cares, mm-hmm. you don't have a community doctor anymore. Mm. And I don't know wh- why is that? So, you know, there's been... See, like, all you guys are in Christian Hospital. Yes. You understand my point? It's yep. like a one-stop shop, yep. right? Like a smorgasbord. Yeah. It didn't always be like that. And, and it's changed, it has. I think, in the last five to 10 years. No, you're right. So I, I understand. It, it, there's We've seen over across the country there's been a shortage of primary care providers and that's not just here in delaware but there's been um, a shift for people moving away from primary care into specialty care and part of that is just the way that healthcare, um, how primary care providers are reimbursed Um, a lot of people are coming out of medical school with a lot of debt and trying to choose careers that will reimburse them better. And so part of what we need to do in terms of healthcare reform is really um, focus in on primary care and value the work that primary care providers uh, do in the community. Uh, At Christiana Care, we're investing in expanding primary care because we think it's foundational to promoting health and wellness in our communities. We can't achieve that without a strong safety net of primary care providers. As, uh, when we talk about that, like a person, when should a person get tested for like prostate cancer mm-hmm. or colon cancer, things of that nature? Yeah. Because I've, I've talked to a couple of people in just the last two years, like two or three friends yeah. have gotten either prostate or colon. Mm-hmm. Is there any symptoms? So the screening and testing for disease, uh, that is the job of the primary care provider to guide you through all of those decisions. There's so many different screening tests. See my, see my frustration? Yeah, it's hard. And, and the guidelines are constantly changing. Um, so that's why having a primary care provider is critically important. They know you. They know what you value. They know your medical history, your family's medical history, and they can make sure that you're getting the necessary screening and immunizations at the right time. Um, and then they can also be there to support you when you when you get sick. What about breast cancer? I mean, we have a number of folks in our communities. Yeah, uh, I lost my wife from breast cancer. I'm sorry That's okay. To hear that. So how do they? How can I know it's not preventive? But how can they test themselves besides just you know? So self exams. Uh, people uh, often uh, talk about self exams, but the the gold standard in terms of breast cancer screening is getting a mammogram. And when you start getting screened for breast cancer, really does depend on um, having a primary care provider know your medical history. So if you have a family history of breast cancer or a relative that had breast cancer before the age of 50, for example, you need to be screened likely earlier than and somebody else who doesn't have that family history. So that's why a primary care provider, in knowing you and your medical history, can really guide you in when you, specifically you, need to get a screening test. There are general guidelines that we know for the general population, but everybody's an individual and has their own unique story and medical history. And I, as a primary care provider, can help guide you through what makes sense based on your history. Ladies and gentlemen, watching, watching uh, Norman Oliver, Community Crossfire, Another Point of View, talking to the good doctor from Christina Care. I mean, thank you, Haran. Haran sitting in the audience. Thank you, my brother. <laughs> thank you for bringing it. Um, I have a friend called me about, he has shingles. Yeah. And he says it's so painful, like he can't even put a shirt on sometimes. Yes. Is there anything, is there any preventive medicine or anything for that? Or how do you 
tackle something like a shingle. I never even heard of it, by the way. Shingles? Yeah, I mean, too. Yeah, no, so shingles is a very painful condition, um, and there is a vaccine against shingles. Again, another screening test, another immunization that you can get. So there's a vaccine that you can get for shingles, and that's something that you talk to your doctor about, and based on your medical history, um, your underlying chronic disease history, um, they can guide you on when the best time is to get that vaccine. God, I, I tell you, a person like me, I like to eat, right? I like yeah. buffets. I just said buffets because it just came to mind, buffet. You uh -huh. know what I mean? But I do work out and walk a little bit. Yeah. How do we prevent obesity in our community? Because that's also a big problem, right? Obesity is a problem that we're seeing across the country. And, you know, there are several different strategies around that. You always come back to the core tenets of diet, nutrition, exercise, um, those are important uh, factors in preventing obesity. Um, it's really uh, critical that we start in schools with our young people um, and understanding healthy foods healthy, and developing healthy eating habits that will carry them into adulthood. Because so often we see, and we're seeing a lot of that now, a lot, an increase in obesity among kids. So starting with, with our kids. So you start at a younger age. Yeah, and starting to educate uh, kids about healthy eating habits um, uh, and developing those uh, early is key. Have you had a chance to uh, look at mental health? Um, I mean, we got, again, it's a buffet of issues yes. and problems in our neighborhoods. And I'm glad you're answering yes. a lot of these questions. I appreciate you coming. Yeah. When I just don't think we do a good job with dealing with mental health. Mm -hmm. um, when we even talk about, in my opinion, some of the shootings and some of the deaths and some of the crime yeah. in the black community, I think it could be prevented if we dealt with mental health. Mm. Is this something, is there a medicine or is there something that, we can do to prevent that or I mean because a lot of people don't have the insurance to get counseling now you're gonna get no insurance I'm really yeah. frustrated with that my insurance what I pay for that is criminal I don't even want to talk about it yeah well, how do you how do you is there any way to to find out do we know it at an early age so this is a tough question no no it's, it's it's but it's an important question because behavioral health um is it it covers a lot of diagnoses everywhere, everything from depression to schizophrenia to addiction. So there's a lot in that um, term, behavioral health. Um, but I think what I'd want your audience to know is that a primary care provider can help you, guide you into where to go um, uh, in terms of getting behavioral health or access to behavioral health. Many primary care providers like myself, um, one of the things we most commonly treat is depression. Um, Depression, yeah. Yeah, and that you don't need to go to a psychiatrist or a specialist necessarily. You can be um, cared for by a primary care provider, and that's why I'm going to keep kind of coming back to that primary care. And you know, therapy. and I was going to say that to you, right? Because you've yeah. said that like a few times. Yeah. <laughs> what about people? Yeah. I mean, no, this is very good. Thank you. And I hope people, I hope you're getting this right, who don't have a primary care uh, yeah. uh, uh, advisor, I don't have a primary care physician, mm -hmm. or don't even know where to go. Yeah. And the reason why a lot of these things that are happening, we're talking exactly. about right now, because they don't have a primary care provider. Right. That should be frustrating to you, you and all and all the people watching. Mm -hmm. Maybe like the medical centers in our neighborhoods, yeah. but that's like having a, a public defender and not a lawyer. Yeah. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah. Is that one of the frustrations with you? Uh, one of the things that I want more than anything is for everybody in the community to feel like they have a they, that they have a primary care provider doc, that they can you, go to. Doc, if you walked out of the studio right now, yeah, you ask ten people who's your primary care provider, they yeah. look at you like like you're speaking Swahili. Yeah, you understand and, my point? No, I understand, and that's what we at Christiana Care. That's what we want to change as we think about expanding primary care. One of our goals is instead of expecting people to come to a clinic necessarily and find us in the clinic and sign up, what, one of the things that we're trying to do is really invest in our communities and our community partnerships to bring medical care to the community. As you said, we know that there's there's been sort of a um, a loss of providers in the communities where we live. Yeah. And what, what we want to do at Christiana is say, let's bring the resources um, that we have to the community. So during COVID, for example, um, we knew that there were significant racial and ethnic disparities in um, in getting access to testing for COVID um, and in infection rates. And 
by that I mean that we know that black and brown communities were experiencing COVID more Absolutely. than others. So what we did was we looked at the data to understand which neighborhoods were impacted um, and developed strategies to really get in there to really address those disparities. So we partnered with, uh, one of the things we did was partner with the Latin American Community Center and the Kingswood Community Center to um, establish clinical sites in their, those community how, how centers. How did that work out? It worked out really well. It was well received. We People were able to come get a virtual encounter with a medical provider to get an assessment for their COVID concerns, get testing. Um, but we didn't stop there. We addressed the medical needs, but said, do you have a primary care provider? If they didn't, we connected them with primary care. You know, in my humble opinion. Right? Yeah. And it's hard for me to be humble, right? Okay. I saw a, a video yeah. that I think my good friend sent me. And I think that, I think that going, going to the barbershops and beauty salons. Yes because some of the community centers are just not like they used to be. Yeah. The people are just not walking in like they used to be, mm. but they all still go get their hair cut, get their yep. hair done. I think that if I was an advisor, mm -hmm. which I would be an advisor yeah. for a small fee, yeah. I would target <laughs> Yeah. See, also, I would target these barbershops and beauty salons. Yep. I hear Latin American Community Center because they have a name and I worked at Kingswood under Reverend Oliver. Yeah. Um, because, you know, I mean, mm -hmm. I worked at three different community centers, Hilltop, Lutheran, yep. People's Settlement, and Kingswood. But now, it, nobody's in People's Settlement. Nobody really goes over to David Help, and I hope mm. the community centers don't beat me up. Mm -hmm. But I think more people go to the barbershops and beauty salons. And I think that if you guys would change your strategy, because I hear you saying that you want to get more into the community, community and I commend you for that, mm -hmm. I think that we need to go to those entities. I'm so glad you said that. Cause That's we're, stuff. Because we're doing it. We're, we're no, working. I saw that. I'll tell you, I saw Yeah, that. we're working to try to do that because there actually is a lot of uh, research out there, some good research, that that's a an effective strategy to engage people so that they, a lot of people have hypertension. They don't know they have hypertension. They don't know they have diabetes. So if we can meet people where they are, uh, and that's really what we want to do, meet people where they are and bring resources to the community. Do you want to give people a number or anything? Because I yes. mean, no, because I want, yep. I think this is important information, yep. especially like you said for the black and brown communities. Mm -hmm. um, how could they contact whomever? So the healthcare provider. Yes, thank you for the for the tee up because the number to call if you want a primary care provider at Christiana Care is three zero two seven 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 zero six four three. We're happy to take anybody in um, and provide that medical home for you. Explain that, explain that. You just gave the number out, right? Yep. You said anybody. So a person who's watching, right, comes yep. to Christiana Care and says, I saw the good Dr. Rose on, and mm -hmm. she said, I could come up here and yep. they're like, what are you talking about? I, I have no money, I have no um, health insurance. Mm -hmm. I need a, a medical provider. Mm -hmm. No, it's You really, don't mean it like that. No, it's a, it's a good question because I think a lot of people are worried about accessing care because of insurance reasons, we have resources and uh, supports to address those concerns. So if you say, I need a primary care provider, but I'm worried about insurance, I don't have insurance, we have uh, resources available to help navigate that and see maybe you do qualify for something. How can we help you sign up? Um, there are so many barriers to people engaging in health. Um, and we don't want those barriers to prevent anybody from accessing health. So we have invested in making sure that we have people on our team, on our side, to help when people raise those concerns. So don't be shy about raising those concerns. We need to hear it, and we have resources to support and address so, those. So a person who needs glasses, for instance, mm -hmm. right, um, and they can't afford it, right? Yeah. And like you said, we talk about um, primary care providers. Mm -hmm. We don't have that in our communities like we used to. Like, yeah. you, again, you could go to Dr. Brown and say, take this eye test, right? It's like a one-stop shop. No, you don't have that person. Mm -hmm. Where do they go? Is you saying they could come to Wilmington Hospital or Christiana Hospital? Mm -hmm. Yep, you can come to us. We have um, primary care locations across the state. God, and I, hope this I hope this works because a lot of people are watching. I just... I, I wanted to, we are, we're committed to making it work. Okay. And, and we're here talking with you because we want to get the message out and your perspective is important, you know, um, and hearing from you and, and hearing your questions is important to me too, because we want to make this work. We want to make sure, you know, I got into primary care 
because I, you know, have a strong commitment to social justice and health equity. I wanted to, to work with underserved populations because they deserve the best health care possible. And there are too many barriers in place. And as a system, we're trying to eliminate those. Do you find that frustrating that you are one of few in your field? Well, we have we're growing. Um, at Christiana, we're really recruiting and bringing in people who are passionate about primary care, passionate about providing that care in the community. Um, when we did the work at the Latin American Community Center in Kingswood, we had people who were, you know, banging down the doors to get to work in those places because people want to do that work. They want to be in the community. They want to serve their community. Mm -hmm. do you, let me ask on a different subject. Do you mm -hmm. look at yourself as a role model? <sighs> That's a... I don't know. I, you know, I want what I would want is f to be an, a good example mm -hmm. of of um, someone in healthcare who's trying to do the right thing for their community. So, I mean, like for a young black girl who's watching this show, yeah. right, a mother, yeah. what would you tell them? I would tell them that um, there is a place for them um, it, at Christiana Care, uh, where we want to take care of them. We want to provide them with the medical, behavioral, social supports that they need to achieve their personal goals around their health and around their wellness in general. I tell you, after this show, Christiana Care ought to give you a raise because you have been an ambassador and a cheerleader to Christiana Care. When you watch the tape, you're going to see what I'm talking about. Let me ask you another you. question. Yeah. And I don't know this. Mm -hmm. There's very few things I don't know. Right? Mm -hmm. How do you feel about Obamacare? Has it worked? It's a great thing. I think um, people need insurance. You you mentioned in your in the in the example that you gave, insurance shouldn't be a barrier. And this is my my personal opinion. Um, there shouldn't be any barriers to people accessing good health. I feel like that is a basic right. So. Um, Anything that we can do to expand people's ability to access insurance is a good thing. And the Affordable Care Act did that. Um, so what I want to see is um, policy that enables everybody in our community to access health care. And I'm a, I'm a supporter for anything that does that. Does it frighten you when our sitting... I don't want you to get into politics, right? I, yeah. I could do politics, right? Yeah. Because I'm not afraid, right? But... Is trying to undo that, mm -hmm. and will it really affect a lot of people who you're talking about? Mm -hmm. Does that frighten you? I am very concerned about healthcare and healthcare policy in general because I see um, the impact in my own patients when people are struggling with under insurance or coming in and out of insurance and the challenges that that brings to them, their ability to manage their health and achieve their own health goals. So um, I think that we shouldn't be afraid to talk about the policies that are going I to appreciate lead. That. Yeah, we, we have to talk about the policies that are gonna lead to our patients getting the healthcare that they need. And so I think as a healthcare provider, I'm always happy to be an advocate for those policies that make my patients' lives easier in getting now, access to health care. Before you go, I gotta go right, I gotta go back to a question, right? Yeah. Because it's been a very good interview. Yeah. When a person goes to Wilmington Hospital, mm -hmm. Christiana Care, Christiana Hospital, mm -hmm. and say, Norm, we watch the show, and I'm going up to the health care provider. Yeah. Correct name, right? Mm -hmm. I'm not gonna get a bill. I don't have a job. I don't have any money. Yeah. And by the way, they're going to send them a bill. Mm -hmm. Are they going to prescribe the right medicines for them? Mm -hmm. Or would they have to sit in the waiting room for four or five hours compared to the guy who comes up, who has, who's been sneezing or just an earache mm -hmm. and have a health care card? No, we treat all patients the same. And, and what I'll tell you is I've definitely had patients um, who've told me, Dr. Kokoza, I can't afford that. I, I don't I don't know how I'm gonna get this medication or fill this prescription, and and we ask that question to patients. Are, are you having trouble af um, affording your medications? And the reason we ask is because we have social workers, we have community health workers as part of our clinical care teams, and we've made a big investment in um, integrating uh, those resources onto our clinical care teams because. We need to know those things. I need to know those things in order to take care of my patients better. So I want them to tell me that because I'll work with them to figure out how do we get 
how do we how do we make this happen? Um, who do we need to bring on board? What resources do we need to um, bring to bear to make it happen? So if people have those concerns, what I don't want them to do is avoid um, bringing them up with their provider. At Christiana Care, we're really investing in making sure that we have those resources available so that when somebody raises that concern and we want them to, that we can um, provide them with a resource um, to solve that problem. Dr. Kokoza, you answered a lot of questions, and I asked a lot of questions. I think I asked, but I appreciate that. And I yeah. appreciate, and we have an open invitation. I hope Aww. you can come back, and I hope I Christiana Care to be honored to have someone like you Aww. and my good friend Haran. Uh, and I, I don't care who the hell said. I said it. They didn't say it. I, I, they didn't ask me for an endorsement because this guy's been advocating to get you on here. We've been trying um, to figure this out for a month or two. Yeah, we got you on here. No, and I really appreciate you Thank answered you. literally every question. And I thought it was honorable, and I thought that you were sincere about it. And sometimes it's uncomfortable, yeah. but you did it. Ladies and gentlemen, I hope you appreciate it. Is there anything in closing you want to say? No, thank you for the time, and, and thank you to the audience. Welcome back to Community Cross Find Another Point of View. I'm your host, Norman Oliver. As you notice, I changed my shirts because I was drinking red wine and red real wine on my black shirt. I probably shouldn't have this shirt on anyway because I think I wore it before, but I like it so much. It's tailor-made, you know what I mean? I look at him wearing Earl Cooper's uh, golf hat, Eastside Golf, you know? So I go in, in the bathroom and be like Superman because I could do that because it's the big payback. Ladies and gentlemen, I hope you enjoyed the first segment and we're gonna to stick to that theme. You know, a lot of uh, things happen in our community, especially medical. And we had a, a great talk, the first half when we talk, had the doctor on talking about a lot of issues from heart disease, COVID, uh, high blood pressure, sugar, I mean, just literally everything because we as black and brown community, we catch stuff that they haven't even invented yet. So this segment, we're going to deal with sickle cell. Um, sickle cell anemia, um, I was involved at a, uh, about 10, 15 years ago, 20, maybe longer, with May, Osborne Macy, rest in peace, where we would go to, we would ha actually we had an event at, um, with um, late mayor, De when, when Jim Seals was the mayor, we had Cathedral Fresh Fire, where we had kids, we brought them gifts, then we went out to the Children's Hospital. And it's, it's kind of touching, and again, it affects our community. So I have the authoritarian, the good doctor. How you doing, Dr. Nina? Thank you. Thank you for having me today. Thank you. So how, how, how did you, let's go right at it, right? How did you get into sickle cell, and what exactly, I know it's a trait, right? Mm -hmm. what, what exactly is a sickle cell disease? So sickle cell anemia is a genetic inherited blood disorder. And the blood cells are shaped a little differently. So a nice red blood cell is round. It moves through the blood cells very easy. And those with sickle cell make cells that are shaped like a C. They're hard and sticky and they don't live very long. And so under certain conditions like stress, being sick, they actually clump up in the blood vessels. Cool. And when you're not getting enough oxygen and nutrients to your tissues, your organs, it can cause death, damage to the vessels, but it also causes excruciating pain and damage Doc, over time. How, how does one contract or catch sickle cell? So you don't catch it. Okay. Um, you're born with it. It's oh, a wow. genetic disorder. Um, and actually, when I tell people this, that those thousands of years ago that actually had sickle cell disease or the trait survived another pandemic called malaria. So malaria killed millions of people worldwide. But those who carried the sickle cell trait or had the disease, the malaria parakeet parasite couldn't penetrate in the host cell and replicate. So those people actually survived and then they passed on those genes. So is it, a, is it a blood trait? Not really a blood trait. It's a genetic disorder that affects the way the blood cells express themselves. So you would probably caught it from your great grandparent or your parent or just or just happens? It's passed down in your genes. So for example, one of the things that I do in my practice, uh, we have a point of care test um, in which we screen and make sure that people, especially African-Americans, because one in 12 African-Americans can carry the sickle cell trait. 
So if is that high? Yes. Yeah, so if you look at any, if you go to church, for example, and there's 50 people there, there's probably about two or three that carry the sickle cell trait. Wow, I didn't know and unfortunately, that sometimes they don't know they have it. Wow. Well, how do you know? Well, it's uh, you can get tested for it, as I was saying. I mean, do, do, do I mean, like, do you sit like sit up and then like you just start feeling fatigue or lo mm -hmm. loss of breath? I mean, what is, are there any symptoms? Well, let's just first start back that in 1990, across the country and over now 50 states, the newborn screening program actually tests newborn babies for sickle cell, sickle cell trait and other inherited disorders that can be. Um, something that needs to be treated right away because then they could have unintended problems. So most babies in the United States are screened at birth and they know within two weeks whether they had it. Now, if you're someone my age mm -hmm. or <laughs> older, you may have not um, been born, you know, after 1990. So let me get this right. So right now today, right, since 1990, this mm -hmm. is what I'm hearing you saying. Around the 90s, yeah. Around the 90s. Every child who is born gets a sickle cell test or do they have to ask for it or it's just is it mandatory it is mandatory yes wow, i didn't know that yes so you know our generation and those older um you may have not been able to be screened right. as a baby and so um we may not have known that we had carried the trait or had the disease is there any medication Yes, um, and that's one of the things I'm really grateful to report that the FDA has now approved three new drugs or disease modifying therapies that we can use to treat those with sickle cell anemia. And also a uh, gene therapy is um, in phase one early clinical trials offers the opportunity for those to be cured of their sickle cell. Anemia. How long have you been doing this stuff? I don't like to reveal my age, but I would say 20 years. You've been doing this for 20 No, I mean, because you're very yeah. knowledgeable, of course. I mean, so so you've done work out of the country with this too, right? Yes. I Tell me about it. Yes. So I was actually um, honored because I represented the United States in Korea, South Korea. Oh, wow. Um, and I went there to talk about the importance of African Americans being blood donors, especially for those with sickle cell that require chronic transfusions. And unfortunately in our community, only about 1% of us actually donate blood. But those with sickle cell anemia are best likely to match those um, with uh, of African-American descent or right. African descent because uh, in our red cells, we carry um, information that's genetically similar to those with sickle cell. And for those who are on chronic transfusions that have to get blood supply on a monthly basis, um, they can um, develop severe transfusions reactions or they can develop antibodies, which can be life threatening. So I was charged to share of the importance of improving the diversity of blood supply for those with sickle cell at a conference in South Korea. So, so people with the sickle cell trait, they basically need blood infusions? Not with the trait, but those with the disease. So what's the difference? The trait means that on one of your chromosomes, you have two, um, you carry a sickle gene and then you have a normal gene. So those with sickle cell trait don't have uh, usually symptoms of sickle cell disease, but they carry the genetic information that can be passed on to their children. Those who have sickle cell, they carry the sickle gene on both of their chromosomes. So it means that they get um, severely ill, they can be severely anemic, they can get sickle cell crisis, um, multi-organ damage over time from these episodes of crisis. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I hope you're enjoying this. You're looking at Community Cross Find another point of view. We have another very, very smart <laughs> person. All these people are smarter than me. I gotta I gotta get I gotta start dumbing down. You know? <laughs> but I mean this is good information about sickle cell. So um this picture, what does this represent? So I uh, was had the opportunity to have this commissioned um, by an artist out of Chicago named uh, Craig Smith, and it's called In the Struggle I Rise. And one of the things that um, we are doing at Tova is we have the opportunity to sell a hundred of these prints um, for anyone who's interested in purchasing it. It's a nine by 18. But um, if you can look very closely, you could see the little tear on <laughs> um, the young man's eyes. But this is something that those with sickle cell um, um, express that, you know, a lot of times they feel like it's a silent chronic condition
condition. They feel there's stigma involved with having it. And so in order to raise awareness about the importance of making sure that there's equitable resources um, in treatment and research and develop for sickle cell, we are selling them for $75. And then anyone is interested in purchasing them, we can go to our website, which is www.tovacommunityhealth.org. The other thing is it looks very nice in your home. And as we get ready for the holidays, it's a really nice purchase. And the proceeds go back to Tova um, to help our clients and our practice. I'll certainly buy one. I'll certainly Thank buy you. one. So what is, what is Tova? You said Tova? Spell yeah, so that. Tova, T-O-V is in Victor A, in Hebrew means good. Okay. And um, so Do you speak Hebrew? I don't. Okay. I'm not going to say this. You, you, Hebrew, everything, got everything going yes. on. Yes. Um, so one of the things that, that I've been championing over the years is to make sure that individual in our community had access to high quality of care. What I found was the bar was set so low. And when they would go to the hospital, when crisis, sometimes they were mistreated, they were provided with the appropriate dose of medications to stabilize their pain. Um, and so I wanted to focus more of a holistic, comprehensive model where that they weren't just treated for pain, but sickle cell involves um, treating the whole person. And that, so that's one of the things that I was challenged with to do. And I was also very fortunate um, about six so years ago, I leveraged a partnership with John Hopkins University. So they also how, 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 how does that work? Patients. So you were John Hopkins University? So John Hopkins, I'm a satellite. Wow. actually of them. And I early on used telehealth technology in which I would work um, with the doctors, a hematologist at John Hopkins, and they would help me manage my patients here in Delaware. Wow. So we've been doing this now for over six years before COVID, before um, there's been this mass surge of using telehealth and telemedicine platforms to serve patients to flatten the COVID curve. I've been doing it for over seven years, and it actually won me Delaware Small Woman Owned Business of the Year, the model I created with them. Wow. So so, so you have your own practice? You, yes, not... I do. Wow, that's pretty cool. So um, you said something about COVID. So does COVID affect, does it, does it have any kind of adverse effect with a person with sickle cell? Yes, it does. Wow, that's sad. Yes, and you know, with African Americans yeah. as well, we were at higher risk of suffering poor outcomes. Um, and I had the opportunity to have one of my patients to participate in an epidemiological surveillance um, program that was started by a hematologist in Wisconsin. And um, Bob, I say a couple months ago, he reported that data to the CDC, um, in which we had about 268. Um, patients across the country um, with that developed COVID with sickle cell and a 7.8 morbidity mortality rate. So very, very high. Um, and I actually had one uh, client of mine develop COVID, a moderate case of it, but she actually survived. She um, had to get transfused, develop a severe acute chest, but was able to be stabilized. Is, is it a painful disease? It's very, very painful. In fact, as an adult, 30% um, of patients live with chronic pain. Mm. That's pain that they have every day of their lives. Wow, wow. And do they, so do they have to take medicines for the pain? So they got, I mean, mm -hmm. talk about the medicine part, if you can. So yes, you know, typically with sickle cell pain crisis, we really didn't have many options in which we could offer patients. So we were treating symptoms, IV hydration, to giving them transfusions, to giving them opioids. Um, one of the things that Sign I- Sign me up for the opioids. What about medical marijuana? Does that help? Um, for some patients, it can help, but we don't know what the long-term effects gotcha. of marijuana are. So we're very careful in making sure that our clients understand that. But my philosophy is we do everything we can to make sure that the patient lives the optimal quality of life possible. And one thing unique about my practice is I use a very holistic approach. So we use minimal amounts of opioids to manage um, my clients with sickle cell with chronic pain. Ladies and gentlemen, I hope you're enjoying this dynamic and interesting conversation because it's, she's saying <laughs> words I have no idea what the hell she's talking about, but it sounds good. So I gotta act like I'm halfway smart. <laughs> but let me, uh, you said something also when we talked off the camera, right? I remember when I was involved a little bit, right? that people, their lifespan was kind of shortened. Mm -hmm. You told me now you have people, patients up to 70 years old. Mm -hmm. 
Is yes. that because of new medicines? Yes, as I was saying, it's very exciting. Um, hydroxyurea was a um, new medication. That was the first drug act FDA approved for sickle cell. That came in um, into effect in the 1990s, but now we have three more and more coming down the pipeline. So, um, you know, back, you know, I would say 20 years ago when I first started, we were really excited to see our patients live to 20, you know, right, but now right. they're living um, much, much longer. And I uh, always share that my oldest patient passed away last year, Mr. Edwin Russum. He was also um, very involved in the Sickle Cell Disease Association in the 1960s um, when Ray Evans, my uncle, who also um, did a lot of advocacy work with he was I didn't 78. Know, I, didn't, I didn't know Ray was your uncle. Ray Evans. Yeah, yes. he was he was a real advocate. I yes. mean, just a community advocate, you know, from, I mean, the mayor McLaughlin and all those kind of guys, Haskell. Right. I mean, good Republican, by the way. Yes, he was a great Republican. I hate, see, to, that's hate what, to say. See, I, mean, I know, I know talking, my history. I'm bipartisan. I, I know my history. You know, I got, <laughs> yes. you, I got you on that. But, but God, I didn't know it was that. I, I'm serious. I mean, like, first of all, I didn't realize, I mean, I realized the impact but not to disagree. I want to go back for a second, right, if I can. So did you start out working like in Christiana Hospital or Wilmington Hospital or mm -hmm. St. Francis and basically said, look, I could start my own practice? Mm -hmm. I actually started working at AI DuPont Hospital for children taking care of children with sickle cell anemia. And, um, you know, at the time, it was always some like stigma with the healthcare providers where they would say, I don't really want to, you know, take this, this young, this patient because they're difficult or, you know, they're, you know, just hard to manage. But I looked at it as an opportunity. I'm like, these, these young kids you. are suffering and they need help. And if we, if we don't provide the care necessary, I mean, what does that, what does that say? Um, and then I went back to get my master's and um, was, I had the opportunity to work at a comprehensive sickle cell center, which actually got funding from the National Institute of Health, which was one of 10 centers in the country that were funded. And I said, hey, I, this is a great opportunity to work uh, with world-renowned doctors that are really providing high quality care. And there were also at the time um, really working on a lot of research um, in clinical trials to really push new medications so that we had more um, therapies to offer those with sickle cell. And I think that was one of the pivotal moments in history that really helped to get these young kids living longer. Say, say that again, because you, you said it was a pivotal moment. So what happened again? So the National Institute of Health um, funded send 10 comprehensive centers across the country wow. and uh, the Marian Anderson Comprehensive Sickle Cell Center in the Children's Hospital in Philadelphia were one of their funders. Wow, that's amazing. God, ladies and gentlemen, I'm, I'm, I'm so impressed with this. I'm, I'm, so how can a person, do, do you just take referrals? Is that how it works? Like if someone mm -hmm. wanted to contact you, right, because someone in their family had sickle cell, mm -hmm. right? Do they, do, can they get referred to you? Yes. And what if they don't have insurance? How do how do that work? How does people pay or how does mm -hmm. it work? We still um, we still take patients that don't have insurance. Um, we would work with them on a sliding scale with what they can afford. But I've been very fortunate because I am a salary employee of my company. Um, my mission is to provide the care that patients need. So we work with anyone Good for that you. needs the help. Do you get grants too? Do you apply? Yes, I do. You know, they're hard and few to come by, but we also try to sustain our program with grants as well. Where do, where do you see this movement going? Because you said mm -hmm. you've seen so much that have changed 20 years ago. Where do you see it going in the next 20 years? Well, I think the sky is the limit. Um, I think with social media, um, the, the awareness of sickle cell is just it's ex exploding you know you see young people sharing their their journeys um, there's lots of organizations that are evolving that are actually um, um, trying to provide more resources making sure that their members get access to care and um, very early on i used to i wear a lot of red <laughs> um, not because uh one, I do like the color red. It also means love, but it's also the color of blood. And so I really see a surge of that as well. You know, people you said because of love? And the red is the color of blood. 
Oh, right? well, I, I yeah. like the color red because I'm a capper. <laughs> yeah. Um, I just, um, I think it's going to become more global. And, and when I was in Korea, um, when I represented the United States of America, we think about all of the uh, countries that had those um, who are living with um, sickle cell. And even in India, um, there are many, many. Have uh, you been to India? I have not yet, but I do want to go there. I believe you. I mean, Sounds to me like you, you're getting global, like you, yeah. you mean, worldwide. Yes. You know what I mean? Yes. Mm -hmm. And um, probably. So, do you do many speaking engagements? I haven't since COVID, um, but, but I. But you used to. Yes, yes, yes. Like outside do, of Delaware, yes. Well, I just do seminars. Um, no seminars, but that's a great idea. I've done a lot of virtual forums. Um, I did one for World Sickle Cell Day in June. Um, June 19th. Where so I, World, World Sickle Cell Day is June the 19th? Yes, and I, I did a virtual forum with a partnership with the We Love You Foundation. They actually paid for my um, way to go to um, to Korea, but they're an NGO that has over 250,000 members, and they're in about 50 countries across the United wow. States. And um, that was a great uh, partnership. We actually had about 1,000 people that attended the forum from as far as Russia oh, get out to here. Angola and Africa. Wow. So do you have a staff? I do. <laughs> How many people on your staff? I have four people on my staff. I'm really grateful for that. You know, being a small black owned business. No, this is you know, this is fascinating. It's it's challenging, you know, especially the population that I serve. Um, we really have to be fiscally <laughs> conservative, but also um, look for opportunities to expand. But yes, I do have a staff. Um, they're very well trained um, and they're very passionate about serving the community. Where's as your well. office located? I'm right down the street. I have an office on 213 Green Hill Avenue. Um, it's actually located at Family Medicine at Green Hill, which is a patient centered medical home. And I'm also a senior research fellow at Delaware State University. So I have an oh. office there. I Yo, know like all, all, that, all this stuff is all this stuff is coming home. God, Dr. Scott, I mean, Dr. Nina, this is very impressive stuff. I mean, I know Julius, I mean, your husband. I got to give Julius yeah. a shout out. But I didn't know how detailed what you were doing. And I'm very honored and proud mm -hmm. that you came on here to talk about an issue that's so sensitive right. but so necessary. Yes. You know, because we just don't get that information out, right? Right. It's very important that people know. I mean, I'm I, I'm, I'm always saying I'm proud because I grew up in Wilmington and I came back to serve my community. And this is something that my father, um, Ray Evans, my uncle, would be very proud of. Well, I, I, I tell you, you have a, a athletic family, Phil Anderson. They, t they tell me your dad was very athletic also. Yes, yes. He had he held the record in the half mile at University of Delaware for 30 years. And he was also on one of the winning four by four teams that That's right, Bob that's, that's King. Um, Bob King, yeah. Yeah. Is his first yeah. name Phil also? Yes. Wow. <laughs> so he's a Howard Wildcat, my dad. Yeah. What, what, what school did you go to, high school? I went to John Dickinson High School. I'm proud to say I'm a public school graduate. <laughs> and then I went to University of Delaware for my oh, good for you. bachelor's and master's degree. And, but I thank you. Is there anything you want to cover again? Yeah, I'm, I just I'm, want to say um, for thank you for having me on the show today. And I... Also, my company owns the trademark for Sickle Cell Lives Matter. And that's one of the other things that I have done to really try to reduce the stigma. Oh, wow. Of sickle cell. Wow. And um, for those who have the condition to be very proud and to know that um, we we are, I, I love my patients very gracefully. And, then, and I let, want let, them to, let's, let's, oh, this way, you see? And um, Sickle Cell Lives Matter, my company owns the trademark and we sell these t-shirts. See, not, well. only your one for you. not, not only your doctor, you're very smart. <laughs> <laughs> like, I'm going to get the trademark. Yeah. <laughs> and since I'm going to buy a picture, I'm going to take a shirt too. But that's some good stuff. Yeah. You ought to be, I mean, like, I'm serious. Like, we're kind of, I'm very proud of you. Thank I mean, you. And because, again, I know I worked with it, I mean, a little yeah. while. Like, mm -hmm. I, probably like a few months, you know, because we did, I think, again, we would do Christmas parties for uh, sickle cell patients. And what you're doing is, is phenomenal. Thank you. You know, and I'm sure, like, most people would know somebody who a sickle cell patient. Like, I know someone. Mm -hmm. One mm -hmm. of my friend's daughter, mm -hmm. you know, and I, I, won't, I won't mention his name. Yeah. But, but it's, it's, it's real. You yes, know. very do, much. Do you so. have a phone number, um, uh, a mm -hmm. website, or yes. email address? So my website is www.tovacommunityhealth.org. 
You can also find us on Facebook at Tova Community Health or Instagram at Tova Community Health. And our phone number, if you want to reach us, is 302-429-5870, extension 120. We'd be happy to help. Thank you so very much for coming. And ladies and gentlemen, I hope you enjoyed um, this doctor segment because sometimes we got to talk about real issues that are affecting our community. It's not just politics all the time. No, these are real issues. And also, before before I go, before I forget, you know, because of the pandemic, we have to cancel the turkey drive this year. Oh. Yeah, you know, I've been doing the turkey drive for over 30 years, and we just can't afford to go into senior high rises mm. and someone get affected. We, you know, because we have groups, and right. also Food Lion can't afford to bring turkeys in like that. So what we're going to try mm. to do is get some gift certificates to give to like the senior managers in the 12 high rises in the city mm -hmm. and just hand them to them like social distance and they can give them to the people. So uh, sorry for that, but maybe next year, you know, but again, it's just the, like you said, this is the world we're living in. Yes, this is the COVID new normal. The COVID new normal. Thank you, Doc. Thank Julius, you. Julius, thank you for uh, allowing your wife to come on and <laughs> share this in, uh, great information. And we'll be back next week, the big payback. Revenge!